the OMG cable is not your full-time job, yeah? Correct. Yeah, wow. OMG cable is kind of a side uh, side thing, and that's just some, something I threw together uh, and initially released, but it has grown since then. Like, it, it, there's a lot of overlap between between both sides of that, and uh, it's a lot of fun. But uh, yeah, that, that's technically a, a separate uh, project. A lot of people can't talk about the stuff publicly that they do yeah. when they're using it professionally, but these are being deployed in like real world scenarios by basically every industry you can think of. And, you know, for them, this is like, yeah, just give me 10, right? Like, like this is, this is easy. Um, for reference, this was, it was a 2008 document called the NSA. I was gonna ask you, is, this the, is this the NSA thing? Yeah. Go on, now, yeah. the, there is in the NSA and catalog that was leaked. Uh, it was dated 2008, and they were announcing that in 2009, they would have this thing called the Cotton of Mouth One. Yeah. That is, you know, a very chunky USB cable, even for 2009, like it's really thick. And, you know, it had wireless capabilities to, you know, attack over USB. Um, and the price on that was over $1 million That's for insane. 20 cables. So, and, you know, and, and, you've, and you've bought it down to like 100. Oh, yeah, exactly. Two hundred dollars. It's crazy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. It, depending on which cable it is, and that's the other thing. That's why I have different grades. Like I try to keep some that are like, hey, I don't need all the things. I don't need all the which yeah. is cool. Well, here's a lower priced one, right? Remember you and Darren made a video. How far away yeah. did you test the Wi-Fi capability? Because a lot of guys so, say to me, like, David, it's right next to you. I mean, that doesn't count. Yep. Yeah. So that I mean, that is a common problem with some of uh similar devices that are out yeah. there. They've got really, really limited range. And because they're nothing more than like a demo device, or you know, there's a lot of reasons for that. But basically, um, with the type C cables, you know, the C lightning, C to C, um, there was a lot more R and D time. Now probably worth mentioning that the initial batch of cables that came out in uh, basically New Year's 2020, so uh, almost two years ago now, uh, I've been taking all the profits from that and throwing it right back in R&D because I want to see like how much more can we turn the thing up, right? Like I want to see how <laughs> far it goes. So part of that with the redesign, I had to massively shrink everything down. So going from A to C, I think I had to reduce the board by about 50%, which is already like tiny, but um, I, I, I can show you, but it's, it's hard to see on the camera because how small they are. But, um, part of that was also like, well, how much better can the antenna be? Right. Yeah. So I, you know, I'm like, oh, I hope we get, you know, maybe a few hundred, uh, yards or something meters, um, in testing. And Darren, uh, was like, Hey, come over. We're going to do this in downtown Oakland. We, you know, we got an opportunity. And so, I mean, we, we tested it in downtown Oakland. Now, this this is very specific in how we did it. The cable itself can be used in so many different ways. Like if you want maximum range, this is how you how to do it. If you want you know maximum control, maximum autonomy, each way is a little bit different because the, the cable has so much different. It's got a lot of flexibility in how you do it. So if your primary goal is maximum distance, you do it this way which is you leverage a Wi-Fi trigger along with a transmitter that has a large directional uh, antenna on it to send a packet at the cable, which is what we did. We took a large uh, parabolic antenna and pointed it out into Oakland. We got uh, over a mile of uh, range. It was that's it was insane. absolutely crazy. I didn't I didn't expect it when we went out there. Like we I just mean, that's insane walking. with buildings yeah. and everything else. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Exactly. We like we we have the full thing. Um, there's a there's a little animation in the video where you see like a red line going through the sea. Yep. That's like that is the exact path that the wireless took to get to us. And uh, I mean, it was line of sight. 
but it was through downtown Oakland with all the noise. We ended up having to stop because there was a giant building like in her path. And we're like, oh, can't, can't go through the federal building. Um, so uh, that was really cool. I didn't expect that, but this, this is combining both, you know, the aspect of a blind Wi-Fi trigger where you don't actually have to update the payload. It's already there and you just want to kick it off. Um, if you're only trying to send a single packet, that's all you need for a Wi-Fi trigger, right? You don't have to have the full session. So that gives you so much more range than like a tr traditional like activated session. So um, yeah, that was pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, that's insane. That kind of distance, you should work for a Wi-Fi vendor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so the, the guy who helped this is a professional RF engineer, right? Okay. Like, I'm like, here's my design. How do we make it a little better? And, you know, he helped optimize and tune it. And uh, we, we got a lot more out of it. So I've had people that do the, um, the field deploys and stuff like that saying, hey, this, this you know, this hundred-ish dollar device just got me a five-figure um, engagement yeah. And, uh, you know, they keep reusing it. And like, oh, I got, I got five of them now off this one cable. And I'm like, man, give, give me some of that money. <laughs> <laughs> I, need, I need to like have commissions or something. You now. should. Yeah. Um, Hey everyone, David Bombal back with a very exciting guest. MG, welcome. Hey, how's it going? Nice to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. So let's start off. How on earth did you get to this? You know, these look just like normal Apple cables. Can you give us a little bit of a story? And I mean, just take it away. Let us know. Yeah, you totally. Know, how, did you, how did you get to this? Um, it's, it's kind of a long blurry line of a story with many fragments of pathways, but God, so going back to, I think it was 2017, I saw just a picture on the internet of yep. a thumb drive opened up and there was a firecracker inside of it, you know, explosive device. I have no idea if it works or anything like that, but you, you see it and everyone who, is, who saw that picture had a very immediate visceral reaction of like, oh crap, what? That's crazy. Uh, I like that, right? Like, I'm yeah. like, oh, that was cool. But what if we could make it worse? What if we could combine it with a USB <laughs> rubber ducky? Um, and that's kind of where I first, you know, I'm like, okay, I got to figure out how to like deal with hardware and all this stuff. So, uh, you know, I opened up a rubber ducky. There's not much space inside for the uh, activities, you know, explosions. No. Yeah. Uh, so I'm like, okay, well, I have to figure out how to shrink this, get more space, you know, whatever it is. So eventually I started, you know, looking into alternate ways of doing keystroke injection on hardware and, um, I think you've probably even shown it on your show with like a DigiSpark and stuff like that. Yeah, um, I, I, I haven't, but I've seen them. Yeah. Okay, a yeah, lot of people yeah. show that. And yeah. the, now, to HackFi's credit, uh, there's a big difference between a Ducky and a DigiSpark. Like, it's pretty substantial in terms of performance and like capacity and all these things. But for my needs, I just need to type a really little tiny, just to, just to prove I can type, right? And then um, I built, I basically found a way to reduce that, reduce it, reduce it, just removing components kind of trial by error down to something that was, I don't know, I think at the time it was something like eight by 12 meters. Like, you know, it was, it was like that big, right? Yeah. It's like, that's all the circuitry. And I stuffed that inside of a USB shell. And then I had enough uh, space to also put a firecracker in there. And then I hooked up some extra leads to the, um, it was an AT Tiny 85. That's the chip I ended up using. There were some extra pins that were unused. I used that basically with a, uh, a switch that would allow me to ignite the firecracker optionally in code. So like I had the, you know, the open your browser, uh, I had to go to, I should, I should just link you to this, but it, it opened up to a video of a um, Jack in the box unwinding, but it took a really long time so you can build up the tension. Yeah. And, and then um, the firecracker would go off at the end of that after a set amount of time and explode confetti goes everywhere. Right. So that was, you know, it was a fun project. I'm like, Hey, you know, let's release that. And you're like, what, what does this have to do with cables? Right. Um, <laughs> later on, I, I was looking around, uh, I think it was probably Amazon, or just like just USB repair stuff, right? And I noticed yeah. they made these USB repair boots for cables. Like they're, I mean, they're big and clunky. Like it's nobody uses cables like this anymore, but I saw it. I'm like, oh, it's a little clamshell. There's space in there. 
oh man, there's enough space in there for my little implant I made. I have a, I have a really tiny implant I can use on other things. And that's kind of the very first generation of a malicious cable. And I really sat, I think it was like late 2017 when I put that out there. And then, you know, paused a bit again. And then, then what happened is in between jobs, this was, I think, the end of 2018, so about a year later, I took six weeks off because I wanted to chase that more. Like, how much more could I do here? Like, yeah. DigiSparks are really, really low performing in terms of keystroke injection. I mean, there's just so much more you could do. Like, I wanted a wireless interface. I want to be able to push payloads completely remotely on the fly. Like, if you have to preload a keystroke injection payload and then off it goes and you just hope it works, like that, there's so many limitations there. What if I could just on the fly, once it's been in play, push new, new payloads, right? Uh, full control, like just do everything. Um, but I also wanted to put an extra constraint there, which is I want it to be identical to the leanest cable out there that, you know, that was at least a type A cable, right? And so you're, you're a masochist, is that right? I mean, a little bit. <laughs> I mean, I, so you really I, pushed it. Go on. I, I find you get really interesting creative results when you put a very firm constraint in some yeah. form, whether it's physical size, whether it's price point, whether it's, uh, I mean, there, you, you take your pick, right? In this case, it was physical size. And that forces you to really think about things in interesting ways. Most people who design, and so during this window, I had kind of taught myself Using this PCB mill made by uh, Bantam Tools, if you want to look them up, um, basically learned how to design PCBs and- You did that in six weeks? I mean, I was doing like 16 hour days okay. uh, on the weekends too. So, you know, it was probably a bit longer in like rational wow. person time, but yes, it was about six <laughs> weeks um, where I kind of knew the basics, but yeah, here's the problem with um, hardware is with code, you can just modify some code, yeah. hit compile, test it. It's like seconds, right? Yeah. But for hardware production, you're like, okay, I want to design a PCB and I want to test it. So you design it, you send it off to a fab. That, that takes a few weeks usually, right? To get it back and then you test it. And I mean, that's what, like a two, three week spin time versus seconds for software. Yeah, That's, that's hard for someone like me who learns by trial and error. Like I like to just, I don't quite know what this does. I want to change this and see what happens, right? And test. Uh, this allowed me to kick things out like in an hour or less, depending on the complexity of the board, right? Like it's it's significantly lower when you can do the whole thing in well under a day and just keep iterating and iterating. And I made so many different versions of this. If you got some samples, oh, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt the story. I think I might actually. That's, that's, it's great. And so yeah, I, I would go on little like, tangents within that. I'm like, oh, I can make different color PCBs and all, all that, that type of stuff, right? You, you, you're in your garage, is that right? Yeah, this is this is my garage. And that's so, the home of like OMG cable. Yeah, I, I uh, do a lot of the R&D here, a lot of the testing. I will get into the the actual production testing because there's a, there's a be good, yeah. lead up to that. There's so much there. Um, yeah, so you were asking, do I have samples? I do have yeah. samples. <laughs> Here are a few. And so here's kind of like a, a large breakout board. Let's see if I can get it to focus. Yep. So, you know, this yeah. is just everything kind of exploded so I can test and modify components, move them around. And here is kind of an example of one. You know, I was using red coloring for both of these. And uh, you can kind of see, I mean, really tiny, right? Wow. The idea is they fit into. Do I have a sample of those? Yep. So those would fit into kind of the, uh, the USB shell, right? So there's yeah. a, there we go. So the USB shell kind of has some space right here. Um, that's, you know, where the wires go and stuff like that. So. That's that's you know the kind of the idea of it, right? But you know, getting getting that in there, making sure it's not throwing too much power, make sure it's not overheating. Like, how many components can I remove and have it still work? How do I get a decent Wi-Fi range? Things like that. That took a lot of trial and error as well. I mean, my the very first prototype I released um, at the end of this, that thing would overheat within 
like 20 minutes of using, right? It was enough for a proof of concept to get it out yeah. there and, and see if uh, anybody wanted to help me play around with this, develop more. And a whole lot of people did. And then it just kind of took off. And it's like, okay, I need people to help on uh, the JavaScript portion of this. There, there are so many layers, right? So you got the physical hardware, which, you know, you got to shrink it down a lot. Then you've got the firmware that runs on that hardware to do all the, you know, the USB type things. And then uh, there's a JavaScript front end that runs in your browser to make the user experience really nice. So, you know, there, there's uh, keystroke injection tools out there where you got to like compile Arduino and push the firmware, you know, things like that, right? I'm like, no, I want this to be like one click, right? You just type this stuff in a web browser and you hit go, right? Like all that's still happening behind the scenes. When you hit, click go, it compiles into bytecode that sends it off to the back end. The back end then you know transforms that a couple more times. And there's a lot going on there, a lot of moving pieces, but uh, it keeps yeah. evolving. And you know, uh, God, what was it? Keystroke uh, injection was the first th first thing, of course. And then we started adding things like, wait a second, we got Wi-Fi here. We could do like pseudo um, geo geofencing effectively, right? Yeah. So started adding that, uh, started adding like self-destruct features, which do for the people who have one of these cables, uh, self-destruct does not physically blow up the cable, much like the <laughs> origins of this. Um, that is just to erase the firmware. Um, good for many different scenarios, letting blue team test their forensics approaches, things like that. Or maybe if you're a red team and you, when you physically lose control of a device that you're using for an operation, that creates an interesting liability problem where you know, where does that go? Like you, you're no longer physically controlling it, but you maybe have some weaponized code on there. That can be a problem, especially, you know, from a legal team who doesn't want that to leak. So you can put some gates on that that will self-destruct if it leaves the premises, things like that. And that's, you know, interesting stuff to play with. And then we added uh, key logging because there's a lot of keyboards out there these days that are increasingly more common that use a USB cable to either completely do all their functionality or just charge but you think it's just charged. The reality is when you plug a lot of those keyboards in, they become a standard USB keyboard and the keystrokes are going over that cable and you can pull the keystrokes off. Um, we've got a few other things in the R&D bucket that uh, I'm still playing with. And it's like, yeah, well, uh, let's- Are you tease us or is it, is it secret? Uh, that's, the problem is with the R&D bucket, like if I say it's good, like here yeah, it people, is, people are gonna I want think it. it's going to happen. That's the yeah, problem with R&D yeah. is it, it may not happen. There's a lot of things that just do not pan out, right? And maybe it's, you know, physical size. Maybe it's just technical limitations. There's uh, the type C spec just for power delivery is over 600 pages. Nice. Over just, just for the power delivery of a type C cable, right? And that alone creates a lot of complexity in design and a lot of opportunity in the attack surface. I mean, it's, it's huge compared to other things. So things like that, you know, there, there are things that have been unexplored. The USB-C to C cable uh, that we call it, you know, the directional cable, that's not a standard USB cable. They're, like if you Google C to C directional, that doesn't exist. That's not real. Like we're kind of dancing around spec to give uh, somebody doing demos more flexibility. Uh, that's why you know it works differently depending on which direction it's plugged into. So fun stuff. Yeah. What, so let me let me let me address some of the concerns or questions I've had on the videos that I've created. Yeah, yeah. First thing is you can power a device through this cable. Yeah. So like yep, a phone yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So there's there's uh, there are multiple versions of the cable, right? Yeah. So the you know the original OMG cable and the vast majority of them are like perfect replicas down to the like sub millimeter copies of what is either the, basically what is the most ubiquitous version of that or kind of an averaged version if there's lots of variants out there. Um, and yeah, it, when in play, is going to act, act exactly like it. So it's going to charge, it's going to transfer data between the devices if, the, if there's something plugged in. And um, I've heard from a lot of people that, you know, I gift these two, for instance. And I mean that in like the true sense, not like oh, I gifted it. <laughs> I, but like, you know, friends and stuff, they're like, oh man, I couldn't find your cable. And I realized for the past two weeks, I've had it like attached to my battery pack and my phone. Ah. <laughs> so um, yeah, in terms of the directional cable, that's a very specific special cable yep. where we, like I was mentioning, we kind of dance around the spec in an interesting way that allows you to modify how it works by how you're deploying it which is really good for people doing demos, educational stuff where they're hands-on with it. 
And it's not necessarily like a field deploy where you just let it go and it's just going to work, right? This this is great if they're demoing in front of an audience and they want to flip things over and like, hey, here's attacking a phone, here's attacking a laptop, and uh, it works well in those scenarios pretty well. So one of the th- one of the comments I've had is like the um, the lightning port. You can't send triggers to an iPhone at the moment, but um, you can to like an iPad because of USB uh, the new yeah. USB connection. Yeah. 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 Exactly. So there are, when people like look at like a lightning port, they're like, oh, it's, it's just a different connector. Same thing they do with type A and type C. It's, it's yeah. just different connectors. That is so far from the truth. So there's a, there's a lot of fundamentals under why um, hitting the lightning is not something we do. Also, there's the viability of the tax, right? Like yeah. supporting like a, there, so there's a difference between like a homebrew, like covertly um, created attack tool where it's for this specific team versus like a something more widely available and accessible for everybody. So that's part of the things that come into play here is like what's what's going to be easy for people to pick up and learn with, right? Now you can technically use like adapters and things like that to to talk to a lightning port. Um, but the the type C has some interesting advantages. Like I had mentioned we're kind of dancing around the spec to allow people to yeah. experiment with that. And there's there's a lot of constraints that, that come into play there. So uh, it's not something that I have found yet to be a viable attack pathway on you know, a lightning connector. But now that we have it open on type C and yes, iPads have that, people can play around there and see what kind of attacks they can come up with and uh, just go from there, right? It's gonna be interesting because I mean, I think you tweeted about it, the EU are gonna force um, it looks like they might force um, yeah. Apple to use uh, USB-C. So yeah. that, that would open up a whole bunch of things. So uh, on that specific topic, apparently they've tried to do this a whole bunch of times and sometimes it yeah. just never happens. So it's a proposal, so who knows what happens. But uh, I mean, there's a lot of interesting ways to also comply with that. Like it looks like the charging interface is the thing that matters there. So I think it would be funny if Apple responded to that with, hey, <laughs> the that lightning port is no longer you can't charge with it if you're in the EU. Yeah. So it's a data port now. Uh we only do wireless charging in the EU. And like technically that would comply with the rules. So, you know, who knows? Um I don't know. Uh you know, I, I come from this from like the offensive standpoint, right? Like oh, yeah, I'll of go, course. Hopefully we work around it. So, yeah, so, I, I don't I don't know. So tell me this is a, this is going to be a question I th- I'm sure a lot of people are thinking about how on earth did you learn this? You know, is it something that you did in like in your past job or did you just decide one day to pick it up and study? A lot of this was trial and error on the fly. Now, I, I do have a background of basically 20 years in just general IT, like corporate IT was what I had done for most of my career. So, you know, that includes help desk, sysadmin, network admin, security, management, uh, all of that stuff are kind of smaller companies, you know, like under 500 employees, for yeah. instance. You, you're doing everything, including facilities, right? And um, eventually I jumped over to the red team side where this is really only possible at the much larger company. So I'm at a, you know, over 15,000 employee company doing red team. Now, it's probably uh, worth mentioning for your audience, you know, what is red team? You know, yeah. is, oh, yeah. is that pen testing, you know, stuff. So red team's kind of like testing, pen testing, but it's not pen testing. Uh, I view pen testing as kind of like bug bounty stuff where it's like, here's the scope. You know, this is the product or the technology you should look at. They invite you over and you just find all the problems, right? Red team doesn't try to enumerate the thing. And we do not, uh, not with, not with the knowledge of everyone that's supposed to be in charge of defending it. Right? Like we, we bring surprise to the table. And we go after like the crown jewels, for instance. So it's like, what's what's the big thing we do not want to get out? Red team goes and tries to get that out, right? And it, we might find a different, a whole bunch of different ways of getting in, but it's all about like that one chain that got you in. And uh, yeah, so that's that's effectively what I do. I mean, that includes social engineering. As it's the whole whole thing, right? So you, so you have the to OMG cable is not your full time job, yeah? Correct. Yeah, wow. OMG cable is kind of a side uh, side thing, and that's. Just That's something insane. I threw together uh, and initially released, but it has grown since then. Yeah. Like, it, it, there's a lot of overlap between between both sides of that, and uh, it's a lot of fun. But uh, yeah, that, that's technically a, a separate uh, project. 
And a lot of people have started to join on and collaborate. Like I've got a great team now on the OMG stuff who, I mean, we're all basically volunteers trying to see how far we can push this and really passionate people, really talented people finding new avenues, new ways of stretching the hardware, new, just new approaches uh, that is really cool to see. It's a really diverse background too. Like the guy who is doing the majority of the JavaScript development right now um, started as a customer and his, his vision is very, very limited, right? So, um, you know, legally blind and uh, comes to me saying, this cable is crazy because I can't feel a difference. Yeah. Like, you know, normally he's using Braille and stuff like that. So he's, he's more accustomed to the touch. And he's like, oh, wow. The okay. texture's the same. Wow. Everything is the same here. And, uh, you know, through that, they're like, okay, cool. You know, let's, let's see what we can do. And uh, yeah, it's taken on a huge portion. Uh, somebody who's helping on, like I said, mentioned with the RF engineering, that yeah. person's dedicated RF guy uh, does aerospace stuff, right? Um, the person uh, doing a lot of the low level firmware stuff. I mean, this guy has a long, he, he's retired now and it's just like, this is a fun thing for him to do, right? So it's, it's a very diverse background and the diversity of the backgrounds brings lots of unique ideas to the table that yeah. you know, don't typically come up. So you you work like a normal nine to five type job, and then you work on the stuff in the evening, yeah? Yep, yep. Weekends, uh, evenings keeps me busy. <laughs> That's crazy. So I have to come back to this again. How yeah. on earth did you learn this stuff? Is there yeah, any, yeah, exactly. Was so like internet question, right? or like YouTube or you know, if I want to become like you, I yeah. always like to ask this question. I want to become like you. How do is there any tips? Any like any ideas? How, how yeah, exactly what stuff. How would I become like you? Or at least so, learn some of it. I mean, <laughs> there's definitely no formal training there. It's okay. it's basically everything that's available on the internet. Like you know, if go go look around like uh, Hackaday, great site, right? Lots lots of people sharing DIY hardware stuff and just accumulate knowledge by just trying out. Like basic Arduino stuff is a great start for yeah. the. I guess it's a it's a, it's a great start for learning some of the fundamentals, right? Yeah. Um. I want to be careful not to like downplay the complexity because there's there's a big jump from like Arduino land to you know what the cable is and that that's yeah. hard to do without a lot of very talented people there and so that's that's part of it is also there's just a lot of talented people who like sharing knowledge out there there's there's so much like go to conferences go to you know various meetups and you're going to find a lot of these people who are just really passionate about sharing the knowledge and uh, yeah, I've, I've learned so much there. So one of these people, Joe Fitzpatrick, um, he does some really good hardware security training. Um, like, I don't, I don't know if you remember the Bloomberg, uh, you know, the grain of rice implant story that was completely yes. made up. Yep. Like it was, yep. it was yep. it's all I wrong, yeah. Yeah. but he was, you know, he's the, he, when, when those stories come up, the journalists are going to go to Joe, for instance, like he's just, one of the people you ask about the validity, like how would you attack it and uh, great resource. But he also does lots of training. So as an example. Yeah, so I mean, you you would recommend like Arduino is a good place to start. Yeah. Um, go and look at the training and I'll, if you can give me links, I'll put them below. Any, any yeah, suggestions yeah, or links? Are there any books or stuff like that? Or is it just like YouTube playing around, learning that stuff? Like if you had to start over yeah. today, <laughs> what would you say? It's a hard question because I mean, I, I'm assu I'm assuming you like in six weeks of craziness, you 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 came up with the stuff. But I mean, how would yeah? How would I not spend sixteen hours a day in like trying to come up with this? Yeah, exactly. I mean, a lot of this is also like fundamental electronic stuff that I kind of accumulated. Like you know, I could take okay. you know a nine volt battery and a, a light bulb and know how to make it light up with some wires and you know modifying circuits like that. Just the b basic stuff. Like you those break fix fundamentals of IT help desk come into play there in terms of knowledge. But a lot of it, yeah, there was no, there's no book or anything is really just uh, looking around, uh, reversing stuff. Uh, I just continually like amping up like, oh, I know, I know this, what can I take and go to the next level? A lot of it's just kind of goal oriented, like, yeah. you know, starting with that constraint of it must do X, Y, and Z with these constraints uh, also helps focus. Because much like security as a whole, the field is like, well, uh, I could do everything. There's so much yeah. to do. Every, like everybody's like, I'm, I need to do it all. Otherwise, I'm not good. It's like, no, you know, you got to figure out what will focus your efforts so that it's like, no, this, this is my target. Does learning this 
push me closer to the target or not? And that helps you select out all the different pathways you could be facing, which is a really hard thing to do. <laughs> I mean, that, that so like, it's tough. I mean, so would you like suggest like get a, get a Raspberry Pi, get a, get a Arduino yeah. and just pl hack basically, play around? Yeah, exactly. Then... Like pick little projects. Like, so that's another thing, like in terms of the goal, right? Yeah. Start small. So if you've got a, an Arduino or Raspberry Pi, both are great. Um, what what are you going to do with it? Like, start with the goal. Like, you know, yeah. that's why I say like uh, Hackaday is a great example. You go there. There's some existing projects. Like, just replicating those projects. It's like you know, I'm trying to think of a good example, but basically, literally, like whatever's on the front page is probably going to be great. Uh, dig through it and try to replicate it. Then see if you can improve it or just change anything about yeah. it. Right? Like, uh, I want to. I just want to look cleaner. That's cool too. That I mean, that's going to tell you how to tidy stuff up and and minimize. Uh, you know, just add a little feature, a little more control to it, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, there's a lot of uh, DIY home automation stuff out there, like uh, God, Home Assistant, like integrated with ESB Home. There's, I mean, there's so many ways, right? But doing those types of things. So I recently, uh, God, I think it was this month, IKEA makes these like $12 air sensors, right? Maybe you, you put that on Twitter, right? yeah. yeah. It's a on. great example because it's so easy. Now, I won't get into the the kind of rabbit hole of whether or not this is a good air sensor. Like there, you need to research air sensors and figure out this is good. For a hacking project, this yeah. $12 thing is great because there's so much space inside, you pop it open. There's like three wires you connect between uh, a Wemos, which is like an Arduino compatible ESP board, really common, three wires, and you connect it back to some pads on the board you flash some firmware. Like I did almost all this through my browser because of how easy they make this. Like I soldered some wires, did some flashing through a browser, did some configurations, and suddenly you you can get a little, like a step step in the door. Like it, there's so much about hardware is very intimidating. You're like, oh, there's yeah. so much to do. It's like, no, get the little tiny projects, right? Like a lot of these are made for kids too. Like, you know, if you're not into coding, Scratch, right? Scratch is a yeah. tool for kids where it's like visual building blocks, you move them around, but shows you the code, right? They're just start start as low as you're comfortable with and just stack, stack and just keep escalation basically, right? Like much on the, the offensive side, escalation is great. It's so much fun, but again, on the learning side. So I, I need to ask you a nasty question now. So let me warn yes. you, it's a nasty question. The cables are so expensive. Is it, and I remember, I think you and Darren or Darren and someone was having a discussion about this. There, is there a huge gap between like taking Arduino or just like cheap boards that you can find somewhere versus what you guys are doing, like the rubber ducky um, and the, and I keep pointing, but I mean, it's just got, I've got these cables here. Um, I'm assuming there's a massive, like you, you've, you've said already, and, and you've said it in the past where, you know, scaling it down, the complexity seem is, is exponential. Is, 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 is that is that the difference between what you guys are doing and me just like going and getting bored somewhere? So that depends on your need. Yeah. So one of the pitfalls that I see super common in, in the space of whether you're a uh, hobbyist or professionals, you know, getting an offensive piece of hardware is looking at it like it should be like a Swiss army knife. And it's like, it's a black box. That, like what, what are the things it does as a black box? It's like, that's usually the downfall of trying to figure out the answer to that, right? Like, yeah. it's like, what do you need it for? And, you know, sometimes it's like, what can I use it for? And then you suddenly realize what you need it for. It's like, oh, I didn't know I could do that. But that that kind of, that causes that disconnect. So like the the DigiSpark is a great example. It's like, you know, five bucks for a DigiSpark. But well, why? I mean, who are you? Are you somebody who needs to send a very large payload? DigiSpark won't work. Do you need to send it as fast as possible? DigiSpark's probably the last choice for that. Do you need it to look covert and, you know, believable in a nice shell? Again, DigiSpark fails that. But maybe those things don't matter, so DigiSpark is great. Maybe you're just playing around at home and you just want to see how keystroke injection works. Cool. Um, there's also, you know, uh, if, if I can reach into my day job as an example. Yeah, please like, do. Yeah. We're trying to do stuff so fast all the time. Like, there's so much tooling that we have to build out on the fly. Like, if I can have a ready-made tool yeah. that's you know, 500 bucks, that's, that's a no brainer, right? It's like, give me that. Right. Um, and that's, that's where a lot of that comes in too. Cause you, we combine this, the markets between education and aspiration and, you know, professionals, uh, these, these cables are definitely used 
for education and they are absolutely used. I hear from a lot of people can't talk about the stuff publicly that they do yeah. when they're using it professionally, but these are being deployed in like real world scenarios by basically every industry you can think of. And, you know, for them, this is like, yeah, just give me 10, right? Like, like this is, this is easy. Um, for reference, this was, it was a 2008 document called the NSA ANT catalog. Is this, is this the NSA thing? Yeah. Go on. Now, yeah. the, there is in the NSA ANT catalog that was leaked. Uh, it was dated 2008, and they were announcing that in 2009, they would have this thing called the Cotton Mouth One. Yeah. That is, you know, a very chunky USB cable, even for 2009. Like, it's really thick. And, you know, it had wireless capabilities to, you know, attack over USB. Um, and the price on that was over $1 million for insane. 20 cables. So, and, and, you know, and you've, and you've bought it down to like a hundred odd yeah, exactly. dollars, $200. It's crazy. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's yeah. It, depending on which cable it is. And that's the other thing. That's why I have different grades. Like I try to keep some that are like, Hey, I don't need all the things. I don't need all the, which yeah. is cool. Well, here's a lower priced one. Right. But you know, a lot of people professionally, they're just going for the max out one every time. So oh, yeah. it's always trying to find a balance between all that. And you know, I, like, I totally get it. Like coming from the DIY perspective, I mean, that's, that's who I still am. Right. And creating things that are accessible. Now, this is also why I introduced, um, actually rolled it out a couple of months before OMG cable so that people could have access to this. I, I call it the demon seed, right? Like just a different yeah. name, right? It's also a, a malicious USB cable. It's a DIY implant. It's basically 20 bucks, right? Per, per implant effectively, right? And there's a, a kit and comes with two implants and programmer and stuff like that. You can get more implants. It's really primitive though. Like it doesn't have a wireless interface. It's got a really, it's like, it's like the digi spark of OMG cables, right? Yeah. So like I wouldn't, for the most part, use that in any like offensive operation, but it's cool to tinker around with. And a lot of people still compare the two. It's like, oh, it's, it's like a build your own. It's like, no, I actually bring a lot of really low level, um, like most electrical engineers wouldn't like agree with some of these approaches, but it's like, how can you stretch it to the maximum? It's like, you know, if, if a OMG cable is a fully loaded flamethrower, the demon seat is like, here's a magnifying glass. Go figure out how to, you know, yeah. make a fire, right? And uh, for instance, the antenna on this thing, it's, it's not a real antenna. We're using a pin on the AT Tiny to sense nearby RF activity. There's a lot of little tricks like that, that it's like, how, how far could we go with nothing? And that's more to get people's heads in the space of playing in that territory, going outside of the spec. Because when you're attacking, you don't have to follow the spec. Yeah. You have to follow the spec when you're making a product that you know needs to work everywhere. But if you're attacking, it's like, no, this, the spec is everybody else's rule. You can step outside of that and play <laughs> around with it and break stuff and see, you know, it, it's, it's really interesting. So, I, I mean, if you look at a lot of the in the wild implants that are out there, they're, they're done in interesting ways. Um, so it's, it touches into that territory. Didn't you make a course? That was along with the Demon Seed, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So that's still in motion. The uh, pandemic kind of really interrupted. Yeah. I mean, I'm out here in my garage. Literally, there's just boxes and boxes if I if I move my camera. So I'm not going to do that. But <laughs> um, yeah, there's a it, being that there's a uh, God. It comes in. Do I have a baggie? I don't know. They come in little baggies, you know. Um, yeah. And you know, you have to solder it together. You have to program it and all these other things just just to get it up and running. So it, it's it's uh, something that requires quite a bit of instruction and that's where that comes from but then like going back to the educational piece that would be a good way to like they start with arduino and correct me if i'm wrong but like just me thinking about it arduino raspberry pi but then get your um demon that could, yeah that, that, that might be absolutely a path, yeah. work it's yeah. not necessarily like i wouldn't consider that like a oh this is the thing you go to go to first and you're gonna just learn it all it's it's more of like uh you've got some decent arduino under your belt you don't like one thing with Arduino is there's a lot of kind of open source scrappy stuff put together. So a lot yeah. of it's like, this didn't work on my Windows install. I better Google all the 10 different things you have to do to fix that on Windows because it's just how it is, right? Yeah. Like that's that's what happens when you, you know, you're dealing with like a $10 programmer versus something that's more polished with professionally made drivers. And like, that's totally fine. Again, it's like, as long as you have the patience to troubleshoot uh, that's a, that's a huge thing. Persistence is probably the biggest thing in security as a whole. If you bring persistence to the table, you're going to get whatever you're, you're trying to do, right? 
whether it's attacking, just learning, whatever it may be, persistence is like the number one thing that will bring success. So if you've got persistence and a lot of patience, sure, Demon Seed is, is a good thing to play around with. <laughs> so I would say like from your explanation, like the million dollar odd was what the NSA was doing. Yep. Um, but that's, that was, you've, you've kind of brought that right down to yep. like Red Team. Um, for I mean I, I I fully agree with you. Like if you, for a red teamer or a professional, a hundred two hundred dollars yeah. to as an engagement is 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 a is is, is a drop in the ocean. Um, yeah, absolutely. Compared to trying to like build this yourself, and then like for the hobbyist, you've got the demon seed, you you've got Arduino and stuff like that. So it's, it's actually like you said, it's for different categories of of what, yeah, what you're trying to accomplish. Yeah. And so what's currently in production, I got a few prototypes out. I'm, I'm calling it the OMG plug right now. I don't know if the name will change, but it's basically the cable without the cable, right? Okay. Because we have put so much polish into the firmware and the web front end that it's now become like basically the easiest uh, user experience. It's like basically the best user experience for doing keystroke injection that people are just getting them. A couple of people are like, hey, can I cut the cable off? I'm like, let me do what you want better. Let me reduce the cost of it because the complexity of assembly on the cable and everything else like that continues to raise the price. I'm like, if I can remove yeah. that piece, let's, let's get things out there that are more basic for people. So that um, is probably very soon going to be another accessibility pathway where it's like, okay, I don't want to solder stuff together. I want to program it. I just want like the out of the box experience for learning. That's, that's another great pathway. I, I don't know what you can say, but from your experience or from the stories that you've heard, what are some of the craziest things that have been done with the OMG cable? Have you got like any <laughs> examples you can share? I know a lot of this might be NDA or you know stuff you just can't talk about, but I mean, have you got any stories? Yeah, in terms of industries, like every industry like that I know of, it has been used in whether it's like uh, industrial, government, law enforcement, uh, definitely uh, a lot of tech environments. I've I've heard from people. I mean, that, that's just using it like as a field deploy, right? Yeah. I, there's so many different industries where they use it as an educational tool. And yeah. a lot of people have said, hey, this one tool has been the most engaging to, from the angle of just getting people's attention for the education. Like I, I don't have any tool that performs better here. I've had people that do the, um, the field deploys and stuff like that saying, hey, this, this, you know, this hundred-ish dollar device just got me a five-figure um, engagement yeah. and uh you know they keep reusing it and like oh, i got i got five of them now off this one cable and i'm like man give, give me some of that money <laughs> <laughs> no. I, need, I need to like have commissions or something you now. should yeah um, but yeah i mean that, like for a lot of people it's like this is this is this is amazing that we have access to this um and, and that even includes some of the places where you expect they would already have those types of devices yeah. There are plenty of reasons why an off-the-shelf device is really good for them to play around with. <laughs> I mean, it's such a it's such a great device because it, you know even in the short videos that I've done, it's so visual and it's so yes. obvious. Um, so I, I I can see the educational benefit if you want to teach an organization like as a pen test or a red team why they shouldn't do certain things like just randomly plug in stuff. It's yeah. it's such a great educational tool. And I mean, it's crazy yeah. to think just a few years ago, it was a million dollars for something like this. Yeah, exactly. And you know, here's kind of connecting a few things here together. So yeah. one of the examples, for instance, is maybe a team needs persistence in an environment, right? Yeah. The thing that the cable that I really wanted to happen from the beginning is it brings this new approach. So it's hard to get attacker hardware in play sometimes, right? And to keep it there. Like yeah. you either have to physically go in and implant it or you have to trick somebody to like, you know, you, maybe you drop some duckies in the parking lot and they walk in and but they, they already know from the beginning, that's not theirs. They picked up something in the parking yeah. lot and it's already like in their mind is suspicious, right? Plug yeah. it in. I wanted something that your target could bring in. They don't have any suspicion and it can sit there and be really hard to find. And that's another thing. So you, once the cable gets into the environment, it can become a persistence mechanism. Like, hey, we lost the shell on this computer because you know it was detected and got wiped. The cable's still there, or maybe it moved yeah. over their neighbor's cube or something like that. Run a new one, right? And uh, combine that with some of the autonomy features in there, and it can kind of automatically do that. And people have created very 
creative uh, deployment scenarios that leverage that and uh, see how far they can chase it. And it allows detections, remediation type stuff for the blue team to uh, advance even further. You yeah, I mean, the problem with it is <laughs> you can't see the difference. So I, I, we have to tell the story. Didn't you, you you tweeted that some of these got into uh, <laughs> yeah. production line or something? You know, what, what, just tell us yeah, the story. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, the manufacturer, I'm trying to remember the exact how this unfolded, but basically what the the meat of the story here is that I think it was around 200 cables that um, didn't come my way. You, know, you trace them <laughs> down and you're like, they couldn't find them. They weren't anywhere in the warehouse and they make other cables as well, like standard cables. And I mean, there's two options that are most likely here. Either somebody took them home, which happens. Yeah. Uh, it hasn't, I haven't personally experienced it that I know of uh, because the way I manufacture these, they're pretty much useless without me touching them as final steps, which we should get okay. into about the whole pipeline there. Yeah, but, we should do that. Um, yeah, yeah. So, you know, it seems unlikely, but what probably happened is they got accidentally dropped into like another of their customers' like inventory boxes. So I don't know like who's buying you know similar cable, similar looking cables, but they might be out there. So that that did uh, have me think even more about the supply chain security of you know it's it's moving around you know the production pipeline, even going down to the customer, right? Like goes from me to the Hack Five warehouse, Hack Five warehouse to customers, right? That's a lot of transit time. So right out of the bat, the first thing a customer does is flash the cable with firmware. Like it's not, it's not armed until that happens. So yeah. that's like another example. But you know, what if somebody puts something malicious on there too, right? Like supply chain security is a big thing over the last year. That is, uh, you know, another thing, like the customer is always basically flattening the, uh, the firmware and putting fresh on there. So even if it was manipulated, it's restored. So, so we, you just said you were going to, you wanted to talk about like the the whole the you know from, yeah yeah it's in your mind so you have this idea and then I I've got it here in the UK so how does yeah. it get from your head to my hand kind of thing can you give us some details of that yeah absolutely so getting past all the the prototyping and the iteration it's like okay we've got the final production one down right yeah make me some cable so there's there's multiple steps. Uh, multiple different entities where, you know, there's the PCB made that is made. There's the uh, very manual hands-on process of putting the PCB into the cable, sealing it up. Like there's, it's very hard to do with machines. So, so you, every, you every you cable is hand-on. You obviously don't physically make every one of these. Is that right? You, you send it to, or do you actually touch every, every <laughs> cable? It depends on the batch. Uh, okay. I have absolutely sealed up quite a few of these depending. There's like varying degrees of how finished the cable can be. Okay. And then I will complete that, right? So, you know, every every batch trying to make me do a little bit less work is the goal, right? Yeah. But it's still very much hand done when it's a finished cable. And then it comes to me. Like ideally, that's you know, fully finished cable. I get a box of them. And then, you know, do I have some? Yeah, right here. And this has been iterated on so many times. This has become a product of its own. Let me see if we can get this in focus. There we go. Yep. Um, and this is hooked up to Raspberry Pi. Um, wow. So, um, so what are we looking at? Exactly, right? It's like, so this is like a really complicated programmer here. It does all kinds of different hardware iterations and modifications to a board or a cable that has been plugged into there. And it just tests you know, like the antenna, tests uh, power supplies, programming modes, and things like that. It goes through all these iterations and checks to make sure that it's healthy, it's functional, right? And that, that alone has gone through, I don't know, probably like 20 different iterations because that's the same thing that the factory uses to test their work. And, you know, again, I audit that again. And there's, that's, that's just one part of the step, right? I've also got this board over here that's just testing the quality of the cable. Like, you know, are all the wires hooked up from both ends and things like that. So there, there's so much of design and hardware design that goes into the unseen production portion of this. So yeah, uh, after testing all the cables, then they go into the envelope and get sealed up, and then I send those off to Hack Five. Do you and do that yourself? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm so you should actually, actually you should charge more for these because it's. I mean, it's it, for <laughs> what the amount of work. It's like you're doing this for love, not for money. Exactly, and that's. I mean, that's that's the big thing is like there's the to get them to the 
quality that you are seeing. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's still going to be a little tiny variance if you look really, really closely because they are handmade. But yes, everything is handmade. I am personally touching every single cable. It goes into that That's envelope. Uh, I'm, you know, whether I'm <laughs> putting the labels on the envelopes, sealing them up, putting them in the box, putting all the cards in there, printing out. So I don't, I kind of want to always print these out because they're so small, but there's these little, I put it in my hand. Yeah, oh! they could. Anyway, little yeah. orange clips. I'll, I'll take some B-roll, yeah. There you go. Little orange clips that go onto the cable because a lot of these cables, but not all of them have some protective uh, plastic kind of on there, like blue film or something like that. Yeah. And I noticed a lot of customers were leaving that on so that they wouldn't lose the cable. I'm like, oh. Yeah, that's exactly no. what I've done, yeah, because you- <laughs> Exactly right. You, 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 don't know, you don't know which cable. It's like, if I, I've got a bunch of iPhone cables here. Like if I if I'd take this off, I wouldn't know which cable is which. Exactly. And I'm but like, you know on, what? let's solve that. Let's solve that. Yeah. Let's just put a little clip in there for everybody and that they can, you know, track it and they can take it off if they need it for, you know, a demo or whatever it is. And um, yeah, uh, I, I like that aspect of it. It, it, yeah. it gives me direct feedback about how I can improve the uh, manufacturing pipeline. For instance, like the first batch of cables I did, 40% of them were bad. Like I have wow. a filing box filled with bad cables because it pushes the limits on what manufacturing can do. The components are really small. They move around real easy when being soldered together. Uh, really easy to damage. Like they're made out of basic, basically glass, like raw silicon, unprotected in some forms. And, you know, things get damaged. And, you know, that's why I still test everything when I get it. I want to make sure, you know, things don't slip through the cracks. Um, but there's, there's very low yields on some of this stuff. Like a typical manufacturing process, like it's, I think it's a one to 5% failure rate, depending on like the complexity of what you're doing. So, you know, this is like delving into 40%. Most people will be wow. like, this is not a viable thing. No. We just we have to make it bigger. We have to make the cable bigger. We have to make the features less so that there's, you know, smaller in there. I'm like, oh, we can, we can still do it. Just, you know, spend a little more to make it happen, right? So, um, you know, learning how to improve that every step of the way, communicating with a team that's overseas in, in some of these scenarios is uh, you know also part of that you know it's it's its own system design and like hacking around it like a lot of the people helping me in the manufacturing plant are kind of hackers themselves in physical senses like they they yeah. come up with some really interesting approaches of working around problems uh, in in collaboration with me and it's really cool uh, I learned so much uh, every step of the way the supply chain problems we've had over the last I guess year now like chip shortage right. Yeah, you've like, been saying that you, it's like 18 months or some crazy lead time? Yeah, it, it, I mean, it depends on everybody and what they're making. But basically, every little you know black component you see, for the most part, uh, on a PCB, it's got a piece of silicon in there. And there are s extremely few companies who can make that piece of silicon and make it you know alive effectively, right? Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, that gets shipped off to somebody else who then puts it into little black packages. And, you know, the, uh, the chip shortage has basically put a constraint on, on that very narrow supply because it costs billions of dollars in many years to spin up a new uh, silicon fab, right? And there's so many different techs and like, you know, it's like, how, how old is this technology? And the newer it is, yeah. the less that can do it, more expensive. Um, but due to various economic factors, you know, like the auto uh, manufacturers, for instance, canceling their orders and then putting them back on a couple of months later, just since like a big pulse through the whole uh, system that is normally running close yeah. to 100% as is, suddenly nobody can get their chips. So I, that's another thing is for a lot of people, they can just swap out a substitute chip. Now, it, you know, that substitute chip is probably going to go out of stock by the time they've created their design. So they have to buy it and then design. But... Uh, for me, it's like, no, everything is like, we're talking like sub millimeter tolerances and like, I cannot swap one component for the other. It changes everything and suddenly it doesn't fit the cable anymore. So chasing that and trying to keep ahead of that has been its own challenge um, while trying to keep R&D, continue to uh, improve the firmware, you know, stuff like that has been, uh, it's been interesting. <laughs> You're definitely not doing this for the money. It sounds like, you know, if you knew what you, so let me ask you this. If you knew what you were going to go through uh, up to this point, would you have started or would it have been too much pain to start? I mean, probably, probably still would have done it because I'm really proud of what has come out of it. 
That's I'm really amazing. proud of the team that has formed yeah. around it because we're all doing the same thing. It's like, we're not in this for the money. We want to see how far we can push it. Who knows? Maybe down the line, it's like, cool. We just made all this crazy stuff. We can we can turn into something legit. And this is you know, our primary job. I don't know. That's that's the other thing with this is there has been no long-term plan. When yeah. I started this project, I thought it was going to be some open source DIY thing. And I quickly learned how difficult it was to do. The first release I did of these cables, I had a batch of them fully handmade, handmade by me, you know, in my garage, brought them to DEF CON and you know, sold them. And they took me about four hours per cable to make. Wow. And half of them were bad. Um, so I was kind of impressed later on when I realized the same thing happened at the factory. I'm like, right. oh, I guess 50% of failure is not that bad. But um, I, I realized at that point, there was just no way this could possibly be a DIY project. So I'm like, let's, let's remove the DIY constraint. That means I can turn up the complexity of the board, of the assembly, and just push things further than you know, a DIY experiment could be. And that's, again, what's allowed this to just keep going and going and going and see you know, how much further can we push it? What new attacks can we do? Things like that. So, How did you get in, in contact with the manufacturers? Is it just like you knew people who knew people, something like that? And, you know, how did you find the right people? Like if I wanted yeah. to build something like this, you know, any advice? <laughs> this is, that's a ridiculously hard yeah. answer. Yeah. Uh, but basically, basically what happened there is, um, I, I'll preface this with saying inventing, you know, the, the general product is probably like 20% of the work. The other 80%, okay was getting it into your hands and it, it doesn't go away. Like the, it's not like you finish it and suddenly your nights are free. It's, it's, it's constant. It's always something, uh, you know, something's broken, something's out of stock. So, you know, whatever it is or support needs. Uh, but the story of that is at DEF CON, I sold these cables. Uh, I had talked with Darren a little bit earlier and he was, you know, allowing me to leverage his, his storefront to kind of push that a, a little bit. Yeah. And at that point, I, you know, I talked to him and he agreed to help me connect those pieces because he's, you know, he's got years under his belt yeah. and that's that I credit Darren pretty heavily for establishing those initial pathways and showing me kind of the ropes of how that works. Um, it's things are getting increasingly more easy, but it's still really hard, especially with any form of scale. Like if you, if you want to make more than a, you know, like a few dozen or something, for example, right, um, the PCBs, the, just the raw PCB with no components uh, of like these Type C cables, is about a thousand dollars per test. So if I want to make wow. one PCB, a thousand dollars to test it, right? I'm like, that would have been completely out of my reach two years ago. And um, you know, if you make a mistake, just thousand dollars, thousand dollars, right? So uh, it that's that's where it starts to become a problem is as the complexity of the design goes up, it's just really costly. And uh, yeah, I, I guess that's the best way to describe it. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems like hardware is such a hard thing to do, especially at scale. Yeah, at, at the scale part is the hard part. And, yeah. you know, everybody know in hardware, you know, they, they're, there's a lot of uh, kind of entrepreneurial types in hardware. And they, they all kind of say the same thing of like, Hardware isn't profitable. You know, there's always like another layer where there's education or whatever it is. But I mean, I guess it can be in, in some forms. But if you go into this with uh, the intent of it's, it's the love behind it, who cares? You know, it's, it's an experiment. I've learned so much along the way. And, you know, that's thus far what I've gained out of this. And it's been great. So what's the biggest problem you've had? Is it this like um, trying to get hardware because of the supply shortage at the moment? Or are there any other like crazy difficult things that you've had to overcome? I mean, every every week it feels like there's a new one of those. Uh, like, <laughs> so in honestly, other words, you're telling me don't get into hardware, basically. Don't get into I hardware. Mean, I think hardware is fun. It's really rewarding, uh, especially if you're doing like DIY home stuff. Like yeah. make your own IoT device and stuff like that. Play around with it. I mean, you'll, yeah. you'll quickly figure out if you want to keep diving deeper. Um, but yeah, I mean, yes, the supply chain problems that have been very in my face for the last year, slow so much down. Like I haven't been able to do so much hands-on like R and D stuff for quite a while. Like I'm tied up by all these other things, like working with the factory to make sure, you know, this entire batch of cable didn't just fail. And then well, there goes that money. 
Um, you know, things like that. Uh, there is so much compliance. Like when yeah. you're shipping stuff from country A to B, luckily, so I use HackFi as, as, as the exclusive reseller. They take care of all of that for me. And that is amazing. So I don't have to deal with that. But there is so much that you have to uh, be above the table on, like taxes, man. <laughs> like what? There's, there's so what you know, registering a LLC, there's, there's a whole bunch of that type of stuff, all the biz stuff. Like by the time you go from, hey, I made this thing to I want to sell this thing, you probably aren't going to be building hardware anymore at that point. That's been my experience, right? So yeah, I mean, you said like 2080. I mean, that's always the thing. It's, 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 yeah. if it's only 20% to actually build an insane product, but then to scale that, it's, it's a huge leap. Yep. Yep. And, you know, it depends how you're scoping everything, you know. Any any hundred percent, there's very interesting, you know, twenty eighty splits on that. You know, I, I if if it's a DIY project that I'm not trying to sell, I mean, I'm still spending like you know eighty percent of my time debugging and like ah, oh, so much reading of the data sheets. You know, any chip that's out there, for the most part, um, you can go and find the data sheet, and it's just pages and pages and pages of like really detailed spec of how to interface with it, and um, that's what happens, and you need to get into that when you get out of the Arduino environments because Arduino ab abstracts it. It makes it nice and easy. It's like, oh, I want to type something on serial. Just use the serial write command. It's like, cool, but how does that actually work under the hood? And you need to use a really cool feature on the chip that isn't implemented in Arduino. And you, you start getting really low level and that it gets interesting and you got to learn how every little widget works. And the reality, there's an interesting um, reality of the chips themselves. They're, they're abstractions of physics, right? Like this is melted sand with really cool chemicals applied to it. I have no idea how that stuff actually works under the hood for the most part. And they put in a nice little package with a really detailed data sheet for me to interface with all, you know, the crazy sand, right? And yeah. it, it's amazing that there's so many layers of abstraction from you know, raw silicon to uh, a consumer using it. Um, it's, it's just amazing and half of the stuff even works. <laughs> so, I mean, your advice, I mean, if I, I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Oh, yeah, if, yeah. If, yeah. You, if you want to create your own hardware product like this, it sounds like it makes sense to, to either work with someone who's, who's got the business side or be, 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 be prepared for pain. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And honestly, my experience with Hack5, I would recommend. Like, yeah. Darren, Darren's a great guy. And great if guy, it makes yeah. sense, like, yeah, totally. Um, if you've got a, like a finished product and it's like, hey, this is, this is, it works in my hands. Uh, you're going to completely underestimate the amount of work yeah. of taking, oh, it's perfect. It's finished. Just, just make more. It's like, no, there's, I, here's one, one really funny example, right? Like yeah. this, this is uh, for simplification, these little clips, right? Yeah. The first ones I printed out, they were great. They worked perfectly until you put a thousand of them into a baggie. Then everything falls apart and they're all tangled together and you spend so much time untangling them, it's easier to just print more. So you have to modify it so that they don't interlock as easily. It's just, I mean, it's just a really, really basic example, but it's that type of stuff. It's like, you don't see them until scale happens. Um, there was so much of that with a cable. Like we, we would do test runs, like, hey, assemble this cable. Cool, looks great. All right, run more. And they're like, oh, actually there's a bunch of problems. Um, Man, there, there were uh, some of the glass was getting chipped or silicon on there that just didn't happen until they made, you know, 100 plus at once because we were only doing batches, of, you know, 10 or 50 or whatever it is through 100. Suddenly it's like, well, I can't carry 100. I'm going to throw them in a bag, you know, broken pieces. Like you, there's just so many little things that just happen and uh, you, you roll with it. And it's just like, that's reality. That's how it is. Luck, yeah. <laughs> it's amazing.